So today we're going to be preaching on the blessing of the Lord, part three, but we will be looking at the blessing consciousness. Somebody say the blessing consciousness. The blessing consciousness. It means that you've come to a place where you are conscious of the fact that you are blessed. You are conscious of the fact that God has blessed you. And so whatever you do prospers is consciousness. So it's one thing to hear this message. It's another thing to develop a consciousness or an awareness that something is there. Am I making sense? It's very important. Okay. Um, let's quickly look, um, look at Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 22. Proverbs chapter 10 verse 22. Let's read together. What does he say? The blessing of the Lord brings wealth without painful toil for it. Now, I want to ask you a question. Is there any other thing that brings wealth without the blessing of God? Is it possible to have wealth or increase without the blessing of the Lord? So what's the difference? So what's the difference? What's the difference between the blessing of the Lord bringing wealth and your hard work bringing wealth? He says, without what? Painful toil. Without what? Painful toil. For example, how many of you support a team in the premiership? Nobody supports any team in the premiership. Does anybody support um, Newcastle? <laughs> Does anybody support Liverpool? Manchester United? Arsenal? Okay, uh, we have a lot of Arsenal supporters in here. <laughs> okay, now, but you would realize that Think about it as a manager of a club. For example, this season today will determine who will win the premiership for this season. So it's either going to Manchester City or going to Arsenal, right? Today. Now, but the interesting thing is that whichever team wins, let's say Arsenal, for example, wins, right? They may rejoice for a season. All of a sudden, a new season starts. The manager again feels that he needs to do something to be able to win something. Am I making sense? It's as if there is no rest. You have rest. Just for a while, afterwards, your toil, your anxiety begins again. But you see, the blessing that God gives, right? There is rest. Although there is work, but it's restful work. Tell somebody, restful work. It's not work that has anxiety, has sorrow, has, I mean, sleeplessness attached to it. You need to understand that. And he says, the blessing of the Lord brings wealth and hair without what? Painful toil for it. Then the next one, NKJV version says what? Has no sorrow. You see some people who um, are actually rich, but the kind of work they do, they work like 18 hours a day or 24 hours a day. So some of the people are very rich. How many of you remember Jeff Bevers? Who is Jeff Bevers? The Amazon guy. Just recently, he divorced his wife. Or well, they are divorced now. Bill Gates, the same thing. Melinda, I mean, Gates. Uh, a lot of the people, you notice that they may be successful in one area, work, but they may lose their child. They may be successful in one area, but they lose their marriage. That's not the kind of success that God wants for his children. The success that he wants for his children, right, does not impact your marriage negatively, right? It doesn't impact your children negatively. It doesn't impact your health negatively. I hope you know that some people are making it, but their health is suffering. They have high blood pressure, right? And that's not the kind of work that God had in mind when he created Adam, okay? So let's quickly look at the first scripture that we've talked about. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 28. God's intention for man. God's intention for man. What does he say? Then God what? Blessed them, uh-huh. And God said to them, uh-huh, be fruitful, uh huh, and multiply, uh huh, fill the earth, uh huh, and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. The first thing that God spoke to the man that He created or the woman that He's created was blessing. He said, and God blessed them. The word blessing, as we said, is taken from the Hebrew word called barak. Barak means to be empowered to succeed, empowered to prosper, or endued with power to be successful, right? So this is God's plan for man. Some people think that God's plan for man is not for man to work. How many of you believe that? 
it was always God's plan for man to work. Work was God's plan, but work was not a way of man trying to labor to find something to eat. Work was supposed to unearth man's potential. What God had put inside you through work, you are able to release your potential. How many of you have ever thought that they were public speakers? You know, some people may not have thought, ever thought that they were public speakers until they got to work. And all of a sudden, they told you, you at work, that you need to do a presentation. And that you need to take a presentation. You notice that as you rise up to take that presentation, you notice, oh, oh I didn't know I could do it. Because work is supposed to unearth your potential, release your potential. Am I making sense? It's very important that we understand that. Work was never a curse. TGIF was not in the Garden of Eden at the time. Did you get that? How many of you remember TGIF? Thank God it's Friday. Everybody's always looking for, forward to Friday. But the kind of plan that God had for work was, we should be saying TGIM. Thank God it's Monday. We're always wanting to go back to work because we want to release our potential. Not TGIF. Thank God it's Friday because we, want to, we always want to run out. Right? How many of us have that experience? Thank God it's Monday. <laughs> It can't be by me, it's good. It should call better come full force. <laughs> because the kind of work God has for us, because if it's work that is releasing your potential, you're always looking forward to it. Am I making sense? You're always looking forward to something that releases your potential, right? Not running away from it, right? Very important. What changed and reversed the plan and the intent of God? Remember we said it was the sin of who? Of one man. And that one man is what? Adam. And so let's quickly look at, I always want to put this in front of you, the impact of Adam's sin. Let's go. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 16 to 18. Let's read together. To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. We just read Proverbs chapter 10 verse 22. What did he say? The blessing of the Lord makes rich without painful toil. That means to be rich and wealthy means you are fruitful. You are producing fruit. You are producing results. Here was the impact of the sin of Adam. Let's read. He says to the woman, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. What does that mean? He didn't say the woman will not conceive and bring forth fruit. But what will happen? With sorrow, it was never supposed to be. A woman is not supposed to be pregnant. And when it's time for you to give birth, you are not supposed to be in pain. That was not how God designed it. Right? It was brought about by the sin of Adam. Okay, let's continue. He says, in pain, you shall bring forth children. It affected man's fruitfulness. He says, in pain, you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Verse 17. Then to Adam, he said what? Aha, uh -huh. and I've eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, you shall not eat of it. Cast is the ground for your sake. In toil, eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles, it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herb of the... So you can see here, not only did it affect a woman's fruitfulness, it also affected a man's fruitfulness in terms of work. Am I making sense? And it says, in pain and in toil, you will bring forth. Yet the Bible says the blessing of the Lord makes rich and without painful toil. But you see what brought toil? The curse. Because of the sin of man. I want to give you an example of how this toil looks like. Because some people, in your mind, you can't quite quantify it. Let's look at Luke chapter 5, verse 1 to 5. And look at Peter. Luke chapter 5 and verse 1 to 5. Let's read together. What does he say? So it was. As the multitude pressed about Jesus to hear the word of God, that he stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two boats standing by the lake. But the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. Then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. When he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your net for a catch. Uh -huh. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and done what? And caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. So you could see that Peter here 
was experiencing the curse that happened in Genesis 3.16. Is that not true? How? Because he and his friends, like I said, work was ordained by God. He and his friend went out to work. And what was their work? They were what? They were fishermen, and so they went to throw their nets. Is that not true? They threw their nets, and what happened? What were they expecting to get? Fish. But what happened? They caught nothing. But that was not supposed to be the way God ordained work to be. If you're a fisherman, if you go and throw your net before the fall, you will catch a lot of fish. If you're a farmer, if you plant your crops, you get a lot of fruit, right? If you're a hunter, if you went hunting, what will happen? You will get a lot of animals. That was the intent of God, intention of God, or the plan of God. But here was Peter, Peter experiencing the contrary. There are some people that don't even go to work, that are lazy, they don't go to work. That's different. I'm not talking about that. But these ones are hardworking. They go to work, and when they come back, nothing. How many of you know that it can be painful? The plan of God has always been that you go out to work, and what comes back to you is what? Plenty. You see the results of your labor, but not so with Peter. But thank God Jesus changed it. What did Jesus say? Jesus said to Simon, go back again. Launch out into the deep, and what? Let down your net for what? For what? For what? Which means he was never supposed to go without a catch. So by Jesus' words, he brought him back to the Garden of Eden experience before the curse. And so he experienced a great number of fish. It's very important for us to understand that. You may be wondering why am I focusing on work, work, work. It's because without understanding this, you can be working in vain. And then also, then you're not able to be a blessing to more and more people or even a blessing to the kingdom of God. It's very important. So our work is important. Okay? So let's look at another side of the curse. Judges chapter 6 and verse 3 to 6. Quickly. Judges chapter 6 and verse 3 to 6. Let's read together. So it was, whenever Israel had sown, Midianites will come up, also Amalekites and the people of the east will come up against them, then they would encamp against them and destroy what? The produce of the earth. As far as Gaza, uh-huh, and leave no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep, nor ox, nor donkey. For they would come up with their livestock and their tents, coming in as numerous as locusts, both they and their camels were without number, and they would enter the land to destroy it. So Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites, and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. Now, it says that anytime they would encamp against them and destroy what? You know, some people, right? The Midianites in the life of some people is that at the end of the month, you just suddenly notice that somebody falls ill and then you have to pour out money into that. Or something just gets spoiled that is so large that it takes a lot of your money out. Am I making sense? This is what they call the Midianites. It takes the produce of the... It doesn't say you shouldn't produce. You will produce. But when you produce, it comes to take your produce. That is not God's plan for us. It's never God's plan for you to work and something else comes to take it. Either somebody is sick. A car knocks out. Somebody steals something. Something happens to you. It was never God's will for any of those things to happen to you. It's for you to produce something and actually enjoy the produce of the earth. Amen? But I want to quickly reiterate. How did this come upon the earth? Let's look at Romans chapter 5, verse 12 and 19. Let's look at it very critically, again and again. Let's read together. What does he say? Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in the same way, death came to all people because all sin. Verse 19. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, many will be made righteous. So there was no sin in the world before. Therefore, there was no curse on the ground before. Now, but something happened. Sin entered. When sin entered, what happened? It affected the whole environment of man. Let's quickly look at the next slide, please. I want to just quickly show the next slide. So through the sin of one man, Adam, 
right? What happened? But the death he's talking about is not physical death. He's talking about spiritual death. That means man lost connection with God, right? Because of spiritual death, what happens? The curse came upon the fruit of man. It's very important that you understand that. The reason why I'm saying that again and again. Was it because of your sin this happened? Who sinned? Who sinned? Adam sinned, and then spiritual death happened. And then the whole earth, curse came upon the whole earth. So it was not because of an individual person's sin that curse came upon the earth. If that is true, the converse is also correct. So who lived righteously? And because of the righteousness of Jesus, what came about? You see, Adam brought death, spiritual death. Jesus brought spiritual life. But you also can call it eternal life. It brought spiritual life. And because of spiritual life, what happens? Notice, just like it wasn't true your sin that the curse came. It was because of the sin of one man. Therefore, it's not through your righteousness that blessing comes. It's through the what? The righteousness of one man, Jesus. But you have a place in believing. You have to believe, right? You've got to believe in Jesus so that you are able to benefit from the righteousness of Christ. Am I making sense? It's very important that we understand this. You need to understand that. Okay, but having said that, in the past two weeks, we've been talking about the righteousness connection, understanding the fact that you are not supposed to earn God's blessings. No, you are not supposed to earn righteousness. No, it is because of Jesus that we have been made righteous. And then because of the righteousness that we have been made, we benefit from the blessings of God. Am I making sense? Now, listen to this. If you try to earn God's blessings, you frustrate God's hand in your life. If you try to earn God's righteousness, you frustrate the blessing of God in your life. What do I mean in frustrate? God does not want people earning what he has given freely. Did you get that? God does not like people earning what he has given freely. Therefore, we ought to go through the scriptures to find out the things that he has freely given to us in Christ. But today, we are focusing on the fact that we need to understand and have a blessing consciousness. And in order to have a blessing consciousness, you need to understand, number one, the blessing of God is spiritual in nature. Tell somebody, the blessing of God is spiritual in nature. Therefore, you may not be able to see it physically. You may not be able to see it physically. So let's quickly look at Genesis chapter 17, 18 to 20. Let's read together. Genesis chapter 17, 18 to 20, about the life of a man called Abraham and Ishmael. Let's read together. What does he say? Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael, what? Uh huh. No, Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his descendants after him. Verse 20. Uh -huh. I have heard you. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. He shall beget 12 princes and I will make him a great nation. Notice what he said about Ishmael. What did he say about Ishmael? Uh -huh. I have what? Uh -huh. Notice, he didn't say, I will bless him. He said what? I have, I want to ask you a question. If you were Ishmael at that time, how would you know God has blessed you? How do you know? If God, somebody, if God says to you, I have blessed you, how would you know he has blessed you? Huh? Because God has said it, right? <laughs> so yes, because God has said it, that means you have to believe God's word because the blessing of God is first spiritual. And by being spiritual, it means that I may not feel it. I may not initially see the evidence of it physically, but I have to believe that I have it first. Does anybody understand that? 
So the blessing of God is first of all spiritual before it manifests itself physically. And so if it is spiritual, so it is possible for the blessing to be there and I'm not aware of it. And it's possible that the blessing is there and I'm not conscious of it. So I can be going about my daily affairs as if I am not blessed. I can be going about my daily affairs as if I am the same as an unbeliever who is doing the same work as I am. I don't know where you understand my point. And if you are not aware of that blessing, you would work exactly as an unbeliever. You get the same results. Because the blessing of God will not work. It only works to people who are conscious of it, who believe that they have it. Hello? So let's look at this man, Ishmael. Abraham understood this because God told Abraham, I have blessed Ishmael. That's making sense. Let's look at Genesis 21, verse 14 to, verse 14 to 16. Let's read together. So Abraham rose early in the morning, a skin of water, and putting it, he gave it and the boy to Hagar and sent her away. Then she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba, and the water in the skin was used up, and she placed the boy under one of the shrubs. Then she went and sat down across from him at a distance of about a bow shot, for she said to herself, let me not see the death of the boy. So she sat opposite him and lifted her voice and wept. First and foremost, let me give you a background. At this point, Abraham was married to Sarah, right? Abraham gave birth to, I mean, impregnated his servant, maid servant, Hagar, and gave birth to a boy called Ishmael. Is that not true? Then later on, Sarah, Abraham's wife, now gave birth to a son called Isaac. And God told Abraham, send Hagar and Ishmael away. Did you get that? Send what? Hagar and Ishmael away. Now, I want to give you a background. The Bible says regarding Abraham that Abraham was rich in silver, in gold, in cattle, in servants. He was very rich. Hello? And, but when Abraham was sending Hagar and Ishmael away, what did he give them? He gave them bread and a, and a bottle of water. I want to ask you a question. If you're a wealthy man, and you are going to send a son of yours away from you. What would you give the son of yours? Gold, what? Silver. Yes, but I want to tell you something. That is not the greatest gift you give to your child. Because if you give your child gold, silver, and this, if recession comes, it takes that away. If the business goes down, it takes that away. The greatest gift you will give your children, yes, is spiritual in nature. Something that cannot be touched by external circumstances. So when Abraham didn't give them silver or gold, it's because Abraham understood the power of the blessing. Because God has said, I have blessed Ishmael. So Ishmael didn't have to take Abraham's gold or silver in order to be rich himself. Is that not true? Because he had to go and prove that he had the blessing. I don't know whether people understand my point. The greatest gift that you give a child is not physical money. It is something spiritual because the spiritual produces the blessing. And the spiritual does not is not affected by the things that happen in the natural. Because the blessing of God is not affected by famine. It's not affected by the stock market going up or down. It's not affected by catastrophes that are happening on the earth. Because it's spiritual. It can't be touched. But that spiritual nature of that blessing is able to impact what happens naturally. Am I making sense? But how do you think Hagar would have felt at this time? Well, angry. Yeah. Why would, you, why would she feel angry? Because they know Abraham is what? Rich. And in spite of the wealth, he doesn't give them anything. He only gives them a bottle of water and bread. And the guy was confident that he would do well.
You see, if you lack understanding of the spiritual, spiritual understanding, you'll be fighting fights that you're not supposed to fight. <laughs> because Hagar would have been fighting. He would have even be cursing the man. Go for me. I mean, I wanted to speak in the language. Of cursing the man. But he didn't understand that, look, the blessing is not physical. The blessing is spiritual. God has said, I have blessed Ishmael. But look at what happened to the bread and water. What happened? The Bible says in verse 15, and the water in the skin was what? Used up. And she placed the boy under one of the shrubs. Then she went and sat down across from him at a distance of about a bow shot. For she said to herself, let me not see the what? The death of the boy. I want to ask you a question. Was the boy supposed to die? Why not? Because God said, I have blessed him and he's going to give birth to 12 princes. So if he says, I'm going to give birth to 12 princes, it means that when there seems to be no way, there's a way out. The guy wouldn't have died. There is a way out. If you understand the blessing, you can never be disadvantaged. Let's look at the, I mean, what happened to them. Genesis 21, 17 to 20. Genesis 21, verse 17 to, let's look, let's read together. And God heard the voice of the lad. Then the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven and said to her, What ails you, Hagar? Fear not, for God has heard the voice of the lad where he is. Arise. Lift up the lad and hold him with your hand, for I have what? I will make him. I will make him. But I want to ask you a question. What was their problem? What was Hagar's problem in this case? What happened in the wilderness? Because they were going to die. And what is God giving them? His words. I will make. He says, lift the guy up. Lift the guy up. For I, I will make him a great nation. God, why are you telling me to lift the guy up? You make him a great nation. God is trying to tell you that. If I'm going to make him a great nation, how is he going to die? Is that not true? Then what happened next? Then what happened next? Then God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water. Can you see that? So the provision came, but God needed to make her see that you need to believe my promise. I said, I will make him a great nation without the water. Once you believe it, it now shows you the water. <laughs> it now shows you the means of survival. Okay, so he says, then God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water and she went and filled the skin with water and gave the lad a drink. So God was with the lad and he grew and dwelt in the wilderness and became the archer. Correct? So that's the first one about Ishmael showing you that the blessing is spiritual. And because the blessing was spiritual, you notice that these fathers, they don't give anything to their children, but they give them the blessing. Let's look at Jacob's life. Genesis 28, verse 1 to 5. Genesis 28, verse 1 to 5. Let's read together. What does he say? Then Isaac called Jacob and did what? Hold on. I want to ask you a question. Was Isaac rich? He was very wealthy. Is that not true? But instead of, you know, some people, some children with their parents, for example, when their parents are talking, I bless you, I bless you. They say, Look, let's get on to the thing. You, you have money. That's it. Just give me money. Money is not the issue. The blessing is spiritual, not money. Okay, let's read. So he says, Then Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and charged him and said to him, You shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. Arise, go to Padan Aram, to the house of Bethuel, your mother's father, and take yourself a wife from there of the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. That tells you that you should not go and marry an unbeliever. Verse 3, May God Almighty bless you, and make you fruitful and multiply you. You may be an assembly of peoples and give you the blessing of Abraham to you and your descendants with you, that you may inherit the land in which you are a stranger, which God gave to. Let's read verse 5. So Isaac sent Jacob away. So Isaac what? Sent Jacob away. I want to ask you a question. Was Isaac rich? He sent Jacob away with what? He said he blessed, but did he give him any physical thing? Let's quickly go there. Genesis 32 and verse 10. Let's confirm that. Genesis 32 and verse 10. Let's read together. I am not worthy of, oh, this is Jacob talking. He says to God, I am not worthy of the unfailing love and faithfulness you have shown to me. 
your servant when I left home and crossed the Jordan River. I did what? I owned, I owned nothing. I owned except what? <laughs> but, his, but his father was rich. But when his father was sending him away, he just blessed him and told him, the father, he understood that through that blessing, yes, he wasn't going to return with the work, just a walking stick. Tell somebody, do not despise the days of little beginning. Tell somebody, do not despise the seed in your hand. Why? Because of the blessing of the Lord. Because when the blessing of God comes upon the seed, the seed brings forth and multiplies and becomes that big thing. People who have the blessing are not afraid to start from scratch. People who have the blessing are not afraid to start from nothing. Did you hear that? People who have the blessing are not people who suck up to men. People who understand and have trust in the blessing are not people that play to the gallery, that want to attach themselves to people and think that oh, it is because of those people that they are blessed. Mm -mm. They understand that the blessing is connection agnostic. <laughs> you understand what that means? <laughs> Connection agnostic. Now, it means that it's independent of connections. Can operate independent of connections. God may walk through somebody to lift you up. But when that person is taken away, you shouldn't think that your blessing is taken away. Because that person was just a conduit. The person, that person is not the source. God can raise somebody else. That's why I said it's connection agnostic. Because in Exodus chapter 1, the Bible says that a king that knew not Joseph arose. So because of Joseph, Joseph knew the king at the time. So the children of Israel were enjoying benefits. But Joseph died. So the fact that Joseph died, does it mean that God is not with you? Huh. Okay, let's look at Joseph. Joseph's life as well. The blessing of the Lord. Let's look at Genesis 37 and verse 23. How many of you know that Joseph was the, 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 the son that his father loved? And because his father loved him, his father sold for him a coat of many colors. Is that not true? Then one day his father sent him to go and see his brother, see what happened to him. Genesis chapter 37, verse 23. What? What does it mean? So when Joseph came to his brothers, what happened? They stripped him of his robe, the ornate robe he was wearing. This is figurative. It's figurative that some people can take what is, they can take something external from you, but it doesn't mean they've taken the blessing. Am I making sense? They can take something, somebody, for example, you know, you can be doing business with somebody, you might have a partner in business, and then you notice that one day the partner takes your money and runs away. I'm not saying that they should steal from you, but I'm saying that you are not afraid to start again because the blessing is not connected to the partner. Something can be taken physically from you, right? Doesn't mean they've taken the blessing from you because they stripped Joseph. But let's see what happened. Although externally speaking, they were stripping Joseph. Let's see what happened in Genesis 39, verse 1 to 3. He says, now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him from the Ishmaelites who has taken him down there. The Lord, uh-huh, success. Notice, they took his coat of many colors. They took him away from his father that used to bless him. So they stripped him of his father's influence, his father's wealth. They stripped him of the coat of many colors. But there was something they couldn't strip him of. The Lord was with him. See, that's why you need to understand the blessing of the Lord. It's spiritual. It's what? Spiritual. People can take things from you, but they cannot take that blessing from you. It's spiritual. That's what happened to Joseph. Notice that in this place, Joseph was a foreigner. Joseph was a slave. But he was still being blessed. It tells me something, that the blessing of God helps me overcome disadvantages. Am I making sense? If you have to, in your workplace, your boss may not like you, but you are doing your work well. Your boss may, may not like you, but that doesn't stop you from being, being promoted. Many years ago, I told you that I was working in a particular company. Every time, at the, when they have this one-to-one -one appraisals, when they have appraisals at the end of the year, all my boss will say, yeah, Gabriel, you did a good work, but you need to improve here and here and here. Okay? First year will go. Second year, Gabriel, 
you did an amazing work, you need to improve. Nothing. It's not, I'm not progressing. Nothing. For three years, he said the same thing. Whereas a colleague of mine who we got in together under a different boss had been promoted. And so I had to go to God, irrespective of, of the boss. I had to go to God and speak to God. And then he took my eyes away from the boss and I told him that he is the source who promotes. Promotion does not come from the east, where south. Where does it come from? From above. So I focused on God. Do you know what happened? I've told you this before. I went to work. I was told to go and work on a site. And in that site, I happened to be working with another guy who had a different boss. But his boss and my boss had a common boss. So this guy said, Gabriel, no way. You cannot remain like this. He took it upon himself and went to go and speak to his own boss. He spoke to his own boss and his own boss went to go and speak to their boss. And their boss now said to my boss, you need to promote this guy. I don't know where you understand my point. God circumvented him and went to his boss to promote me. And then God ensured that as soon as that happened, he was taken out and that person was placed on me. The person walked it, I was promoted. And that one was taken out. And that person, I had about three promotions in one. Why? Because the blessing of God is not disadvantaged. And you can't box it. You can't box it. It works. It makes it. It's pushing, it's making you the blessing. But you've got to trust in the blessing. You've got to be conscious of the fact that you are not alone, that the cloak of the blessing, you are wearing it as you go to work. Am I making sense? It's very important. Okay? So the Bible says that he was in Potiphar's house and what happened? He was blessed. Is that not true? But let's see what happened to him in prison. Let's see. Genesis 39, 20 to 23. Let's read. What, does, what happened? Let's read. Then Joseph what? took him and put him into the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were confined. And he was there in the prison, but the Lord was with him and showed him mercy, and he gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever they did there, it was his doing. The keeper of the prison did not look into anything that was under Joseph's authority because the Lord was with him and whatever he did, before he had favor with Potiphar. So you would have thought it's because of Potiphar. Now they threw him into prison. He had favor with the keeper of the prison. And you'd have thought it's based on location. It not, he was relocated from where he was to another place. You notice that the blessing of God is location agnostic. Did you get that? The blessing of God is what? Location agnostic. That's why a lot of people are emigrating from, from their country when their country is not doing well. They're emigrating to in quote, countries that they think are doing better than their country. But if you understand the blessing, except God tells you to move, if you understand the blessing, it tells you that even where you are, the blessing of God can work. Does that make sense? Now, this comes down to the crux of the message. This is the crux of the message, the blessing consciousness. I need us to look at something because until your mind is renewed, until your mind begins to think that it is not business as usual, I am not operating based on the curse as it was usually, right? I am now in a new regime. I'm now thinking differently. I mean, I'm now blessed. Until you're established in that thinking, right, you notice that the blessing doesn't really work in your life. But let, I want to quickly draw out these two scriptures. I need to look critically to the, the, at these two scriptures. First Samuel chapter 17, verse 4 to 10. This was Goliath, when Goliath came to fight the children of Israel. I need to observe these two scriptures critically. Let's read together. And the champion, uh huh, went out from the camp of the Philistines, named what? From what? Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. And the Philistines said, I defy what? The armies of Israel this day. Be a man that will fight together. Who was talking? Goliath. He says, I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man. Let me fight that man. Right? That's what he said. But let's see David, what David said. Let's read together. First Samuel 17, 26. Let's read. Then David spoke to the men who stood by him, saying, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should... Have you seen any difference? What's the difference? 
Goliath says, the armies of Israel. David says, I want to ask you a question. Were they both looking at the same people? They were looking at the same armies. Why did they see it differently? <laughs> Do you see why David won the battle? He won the battle because he wasn't seeing the armies of Israel as mere human beings. He was seeing that they were the armies of God. So when you go to work, are you seeing yourself as a worker of God? Or are you seeing yourself as other or the workers? It's the blessing consciousness. When your consciousness is changed, the way you carry yourself at work changes because you understand that there's a backing that you have that others don't have. Is somebody seeing what I'm seeing? David says the armies of the living God. Goliath is saying the armies of Israel. Let's look at an example. This is very critical. This is the crux of the message. The blessing consciousness. The way you see affects your experience. Okay, let's look at another scripture. Exodus chapter 4, verse 2 to 4 and verse 17. Quickly. I want us to do it quickly. Let's look at that scripture. What does it say? So the Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? He said, who was God talking to? Moses. Uh-huh. Then, and he said, uh-huh, cast it on the raw, on the ground. So he cast it on the ground and it became a serpent, and Moses fled from it. Then the Lord said to Moses, reach out your hand, uh -huh, tail. and he reached out his hand and caught it, and it became a rod in his hand, uh -huh, and with which you shall do. What was Moses using this rod to do? As a shepherd, he was using it to guide his sheep. Is that not true? And he had been doing that for 40 years to guide his sheep. Is that not true? But I want you to see something. It's one thing for God to do something, but I want you to see something. Let's look at Exodus 4, 19 to 20. Let's read. Now the Lord said to Moses in Midian, Go, return to Egypt, for all the men who sought your life are dead. Then Moses took his wife and his sons and set them on a donkey, and he returned to the land of Egypt, and Moses, Moses took, I thought it was Moses' rod. When did he become the rod of God? Eh? I thought it was Moses' rod. He had been using this rod for 40 years. All of a sudden, he had this experience with God. The way he carried the rod now changed. He no longer carried the rod like an ordinary man's rod. <laughs> oh my God. He no more carried the rod as an ordinary rod. Now, it was the rod of God. Why? The Bible says, and you shall take this rod in your hand with which you shall do signs. How many of you know that the Bible says, and this sign shall follow them that believe? In my name, what? Lay hands on the... You shall lay hands on the... And what will happen to them? The day you understand that scripture, you understand that when you are laying hands, it's not your hand, it's the hands of God. There's a difference. When you see your hand as the hand of God, comes on. Is the renewing of the mind. When I said you shall lay hands, just the ordinary hands, you use it to do all sorts of things. But now I said you shall lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Because it says, with this rod in your hand, with which you shall do signs. Let's look at where he did signs. Exodus 14, 15 to 16 and 21. Quickly. This was the children of Israel when they were before the Red Sea. Right? Let's read. Uh -huh. And the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Help the children of Israel to go forward. But what? That's your ordinary rod. Lift it up. Uh -huh. Your hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. Uh -huh. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. And the Lord caused the, to go back by a strong east wind all that night and made the sea into dry land, and the waters were divided. Hold on. Who divided the Red Sea? Is it Moses or is he God? Is it Moses or is he God? <laughs> because God said to Moses, lift up your rod, stretch out your hand over the sea, and who is he saying to divide it? Who is he saying to divide it? 
But you and I know that Moses cannot carry the water and divide. You and I know that. But who is he saying to divide it? He said to Moses, divide it. But when Moses now stretched forth his hand with a rod, what happened? He said, the Lord cursed. Listen, what did Moses stretch forth out? His rod? No, he didn't stretch forth his rod. He stretched forth the rod of God with his hand. You didn't hear what I said? You didn't hear what I said? What did Moses stretch forth to divide the land? The rod of God. Oh, no. I don't think you understand my point. Let's go back. Go back to the previous slide. The previous slide, he says, and he said, what do you have in your hand? He said what? A rod. Verse 20. Then Moses took his wife and his sons and set them on a donkey and returned to the land of Egypt. And Moses took the rod of God in his hand. He was a rod before. But now, in Moses' mind, the rod had changed to the rod of God. So, he can do more than a normal rod would do, because it's the rod of God. You see, the thing is that the truth of the matter, the way things should work, is not that God blesses the work of your hands. It is that God blesses the work of his hands. It's the way you see. Jesus said, it is the Father that does the work. So, how many of you know that? Uh, hold on, let me see. If Pastor D and Teji, for example, please, if you if both of you, so that they will see both of you on the screen. Pastor D and Teji, who do you think is stronger of the two? People are laughing. Who do you think is stronger of the two? Don't be moved by, by size. Who do you think is stronger of the two? Pastor D is stronger, obviously. Now, imagine that they were told to pack sand. Sand, you know sand? A heap of sand or a heap of stone and move it from one location to another. Who do you think should finish, will finish quickly? You think so? Now, do you know why you are saying that? But what if you see that God says to tell you now, what do you have in your hands to move this uh, sand? And tell you says, my strength. And then God says, drop that on the floor and pick it up again. Now, now you have my strength. Which of the two will finish? She will be the one that will finish. Is that not why, why will she finish? But notice, when God says to her that my strength is on you, notice, what are you seeing between the two? Who should finish, natural, who should finish uh, first? Pastor D, right? But until you see her results, if you see her results, what would you wonder? If you see that she finished like, Pastor D finished in one hour, she finished like 10 minutes, what would you wonder? You, no, no, you, what, would you, what would you wonder? Ask Anthony. You believe that something was, it's not normal, is that not true? You have, it's abnormal. And what of, if you are also struggling to move sand, to the other place. Uh, it takes you about one hour to move some from one place to another. What will you do to her? What will you do to her? If you are proud, you won't come to her. Is that not true? But if you are humble, what will you do? You come to her and say, ah, I'm moving it. It's taking me one hour. Will you ask him? Why won't you ask him? Eh? Eh, why won't you ask him? Because of because you are not the same. You see, a lot of us as Christians, because we are not using the blessing. Our resource and that of the unbeliever are alike. We are limited to our own resources. So it's based on our own strength, our own skills, our own talent that will produce results. So unbelievers do not see any point in coming to ask you, what is your secret? Because there's no difference. But when the blessing of the Lord is upon you, the results will make the unbeliever come to you and say, how are you doing it? Then you introduce Christ to them. I don't know whether you understand my point. A lot of us, when we look at the story of Samson, people who tell Bible stories, in those days, they've deceived us. Because stories that they show of Samson is somebody with, I mean, six pack. You know those guys that, that take protein, that are buff, that they are, you can hardly see their head or neck like this. By that, that's how we see Samson. 
But if Samson was like that, Delilah would not ask Samson, what's the secret to your strength? Because Samson was like as weak like this. Yeah, it was an ordinary guy with no, no more strength if you look at him. And that's why yeah, I was surprised that this guy can... We won't we won stick. 1,000 men were gone. Why? It's the hand of God upon Samson that caused that to happen. So the reason why I'm teaching the blessing of God is for you to understand that we should take advantage of it until even the unbeliever notice that there's something about you. That I, can't, I can't quite produce the same results that you produce. It's not that you suck up to the, our bosses. You're on your own. You are disadvantaged. You shouldn't be where you are. But for some reason, we are seeing that there is a thing, there's a favor, there is a strength on you, there's a wisdom on you that is different from everybody. And then you tell them, it is Jesus. It is Jesus. And then you say, I want to know that Jesus that you know. Am I making sense? That is what, please see that, please. But until the believer has this consciousness, no longer sees the rod, you no longer see the works of your hands as just the work of your own hands, but as the work of his hands in your hands. Did you get that? The work of his hands in, through you. That's what would amplify because Moses saw his rod as what? The rod of God. David saw the armies of Israel as what? As the armies of God. How do you see yourself? How do you see yourself when you go back to work? How do you see yourself in your family? How do you see yourself? Because how you see yourself, right, determines your output. And should I tell you how I know how you see yourself? It's by what you say. Because a lot of us, we say the same things unbelievers are saying, as if we are subject to the same predicament. There's a particular uh, pastor, he used to work with IBM. And he was um, a regional sales manager in IBM. And so in IBM, at that time, they were selling computers. That's what he was selling. But at the time, there was a time when not many people were buying computers because things were hard. So companies were not buying computers. People were not buying those kind of things. And therefore, the sales reps under him, they were not bringing in sales. And he affected all the regional managers. So during lunch, all the regional managers would gather together and say, man, things are tough. Things are hard. Man, we, we're not bringing in sales. We're not going to do well this month. Our revenue is going to drop this month. And while he was doing that, the Holy Spirit said, why are you talking like that? Your lot is different from the lot of these ones. Change. So he took himself away from saying the same things those guys were saying and then began to say what God's word said. God's word says I am blessed. God's word says that the works of my hands are blessed. That I cannot labor in vain. I cannot toil for nothing. Is that not what God's word says? And he made a statement. He said before the end of today, I will bring in so, many, so much sales that I've never seen uh, before. Do you know what happened? By 5 o'clock, his guys were calling him to say, they got this sale, they got this sale, they got this sale. And his target for the month, they exceeded it. And his target, he added it to the targets of the other regional managers who couldn't sell anything. Do you think it was a coincidence? Christians, wake up, wake up, wake up to your power. Christians, wake up to the blessing of God that you have. Christians, Wake up to your identity. You are not the same as a person who is not in Christ. There's a, something different about you. It's not just that you live holy. It's not just that you are moral, you are right, you do things, you don't lie, you don't do this. Yes, you shouldn't be lying, you shouldn't be doing that, yes. But it's more than that, you can be telling the truth, you can live holy and still not be blessed in your work because you are not blessing conscious. Am I making sense? So that's why I'm preaching this, for you to be blessing conscious. And so we don't speak like other people speak. I don't say there are no jobs. I don't say that. I don't say I lack jobs. I can't. Why would I say that? In the kingdom, there are abundance of jobs. I don't say that. Even if in the natural, I may be experiencing it, but I don't say that. Because I say what the Spirit says. I say what is in the Spirit. Because I'm blessed. I am fruitful. I am increasing and multiplying. 
You know, some people use this word. It's not the season. They use the word season. It's not their season. Who told you? Let's say what the word, what, if the stock market is down, do you know there are some people, when the stock market is down, they make money. When the stock market goes up, they make money. I hope you know that. There's what you call shorting. Shorting. I don't know whether you know what you call shorting in stock market, which means that if, it's, if, the, if the stock value of a particular share is five pounds, right? You think that this stock is going to go down, right? You shut it. By shutting, it means that when it's going down, you start making money. So some people shut because they believe they forecast that this is going to go down and they make money going down. Then later on, because they know that it's going up, they don't shut it, it will make money going down. Why is it that you, you say there's a season for you? Why, why, why is it that you say now nah, because the stock market is down, therefore you're going down? Why? When some people make money going down, make money going up, <laughs> the clock, not the cycle. You've got to change that mentality. Imagine Jesus went to work the same way you, went, you go to work. Can somebody just imagine that when you go to work, that it was it's Jesus that actually, instead of you, in the morning going to work, that Jesus just woke you up at night and told you to relax, and he goes to work. What kind of results do you think Jesus will get when he goes to work? Do you think he would exceptional? Is that not true? Or do you know that Jesus Christ is in you? He says, as he is, so are you in this world. Not when you get to heaven, in this world. Inside a person who is born again, Christ dwells in you. The reason why he dwells in you is because he, he wants to walk through you. But he cannot walk through you except your mind is renewed, that you are different. That the rod is no longer an ordinary rod. It's the rod of God. This guy here is no longer an ordinary child. He's a child of God. This guy here, these hands are no longer ordinary hands. They are what? The hands of God. So whatever I touch prospers. Whatever I touch produces results. Whatever I touch produces, brings, I mean, heals, brings about results in the name of Jesus. That's why the Bible finally says, it says, set your mind on things that are above, not on things on the earth. So your mind needs to be blessing conscious. As you go to work tomorrow, set your mind. Do you know one of the things I've noticed? I need you to practice this. Listen very carefully. One of the things I noticed about the devil, the plot of the devil, is that he wants to influence the beginning of my day. I don't know about you. He wants to influence the beginning of my day because the reason why he wants to influence the beginning of my day is to affect my thoughts so that I'm destabilized, so that I don't think on the blessings of God. Am I making sense? So there are times you wake up and... Your eyes falls on your phone. Somebody has sent you a message of negative news or bad news or something like that. The reason why he's doing that is to get control of your day. But once he controls your mind, he controls your day. So be careful. The first thing that comes to your mind every time you wake up in the morning. Do you get that? I woke up yesterday. As I woke up, I just, my phone was on it. I just saw, I mean, somebody sent me a message. See what's happening. See what's happening. I, because I understand the, the plot of the devil, I had to rest. I didn't even respond to the person. I just relaxed. Because the Bible says, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your fools to rest. It's in rest that you win the battle. It's not in anxiety. Mm -mm, it's in rest. So in the mornings before I go to work, I, I set my mind on who God says I am. I set my mind through scriptures. By How do you set your mind? By thinking and speaking. Tell somebody, thinking and speaking. Thinking and speaking. Why? Your death and life lies in the power of your mouth. What you say with your mouth affects you. No man lives above what he says with his mouth consistently. No man lives above what he says with his mouth consistently. So as Christians, we've got to begin to say what God says of us. I am blessed. I am blessed. Say, I am blessed. So in the morning when you go say, I am blessed. This works of my hands are blessed. Whatsoever I lay my hands upon is blessed. When I go to work, I produce results. When I go to work, I am fruitful. I have fruitful ideas. My words are fruitful. What comes out of me is fruitful. 
if I go out, I'm fruitful. If I come in, I'm fruitful. I'm at home, I'm also fruitful. Because that's what is called passive income. Even at home, I am fruitful. While I'm sleeping, I am fruitful. Even my money that's in my savings account is fruitful. Fruitfulness should touch every... Say my pension is fruitful. Do you know that... I don't know about you. Do you know there are some people that have noticed... Uh, my boss during the COVID said to me once... Was it my boss during COVID? I can't remember when. He said, can you imagine three years of pension have been wiped out of his pension? Because... Because they invest your pension. So he said, three, because of things have gone down, he said his pension, three years of his pension have wiped out. Tell somebody, not you, not you. Not you, because everything that comes out of you is fruitful. Is fruitful.